Section thirteen of the House of the Vampire. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Elizabeth Clett. The House of the Vampire by George Sylvester Virick. Chapter twenty five. Only three hours had passed since Ethel had startled Ernest from his sombre reveries, but within this brief space their love had matured as if each hour had been a year. The pallor had vanished from his cheeks and the restiveness from his eyes. The intoxication of her presence had rekindled the light of his countenance and given him strength to combat the mighty forces embodied in Reginald Clark. The child in him had made room for the man. He would not hear of surrendering without a struggle, and Ethel felt sure she might leave his fate in his own hand. Love had lent him a coat of mail. He was warned and would not succumb. Still she made one more attempt to persuade him to leave the house at once with her. "'I must go now,' she said. "'Will you not come with me, after all? I am so afraid to think of you still here.' "'No, dear,' he replied. "'I shall not desert my post. I must solve the riddle of this man's life. And if indeed he is the thing he seems to be, I shall attempt to wrest from him what he has stolen from me. I speak of my unwritten novel.' Do not attempt to oppose him openly. You cannot resist him. Be assured that I shall be on my guard. I have in the last few hours lived through so much that makes life worth living that I would not wantonly expose myself to any danger. Still I cannot go without certainty, cannot, if there is some truth in our fears, leave the best of me behind. What are you planning to do? My play. I am sure now that it is mine. I cannot take from him. That is irretrievably lost. He has read it to his circle and prepared for its publication. And no matter how firmly convinced you or I may be of his strange power, no one would believe our testimony. They would pronounce us mad. Perhaps we are mad. No, we are not mad. But it is mad for you to stay here," she asserted. I shall not stay here one minute longer than is absolutely essential. Within a week I shall have conclusive proof of his guilt or innocence. How will you go about it? His writing-table. Ah! Yes, perhaps I can discover some note, some indication, some proof. It's a dangerous game. I have everything to gain. I wish I could stay here with you, she said. Have you no friend, no one whom you could trust in this delicate matter? Why, yes, Jack. A shadow passed over her face. Do you know, she said, I have a feeling that you care more for him than for me. Nonsense, he said. He is my friend. You, you immeasurably more. Are you still as intimate with him as when I first met you? Not quite. Of late a troubling something like a thin veil seems to have passed between us. But he will come when I call him. He will not fail me in my hour of need. When can he be here? In two or three days. Meanwhile, be very careful. Above all, lock your door at night. I will not only lock, but barricade it. I shall try with all my power to elucidate this mystery without, however, exposing myself to needless risks. I will go, then. Kiss me good-bye. May I not take you to the car? You had better not. At the door she turned back once more. Write me every day, or call me up on the telephone. He straightened himself, as if to convince her of his strength. Yet when at last the door had closed behind her, his courage forsook him for a moment. And if he had not been ashamed to appear a weakling before the woman he loved, who knows if any power on earth could have kept him in that house where from every corner a secret seemed to lurk. There was a misgiving, too, in the woman's heart as she left the boy behind, a prey to the occult power that, seeking expression in multiple activities, has made and unmade emperors, prophets, and poets. As she stepped into a street-car, she saw from afar, as in a vision, the face of Reginald Clark. It seemed very white and hungry. There was no human kindness in it, only a threat and a sneer. Chapter Twenty Six. For over an hour Ernest paced up and down his room, wildly excited by Ethel's revelations. It required an immense amount of self-control for him to pen the following lines to Jack. I need you. Come. After he had entrusted the letter to the hall-boy, a reaction set in and he was able to consider the matter, if not with equanimity, at least with a degree of calmness. 
the strangest thing to him was that he could not bring himself to hate Reginald, of whose evil influence upon his life he was now firmly convinced. Here was another shattered idol, but one, like the fragment of a great god-face in the desert, intensely fascinating, even in its ruin. Then, yielding to a natural impulse, Ernest looked over his photographs, and at once laid hold upon the austere image of his master and friend. No, it was preposterous. There was no evil in this man. There was no trace of malice in this face, the face of a prophet or an inspired madman, a poet. And yet, as he scrutinized the picture closely, a curious transformation seemed to take place in the features. A sly little line appeared insinuatingly about Reginald's well-formed mouth, and the serene calm of his Jupiter head seemed to turn into the sneak smile of a thief. Nevertheless, Ernest was not afraid. His anxieties had at last assumed definite shape. It was possible now to be on his guard. It was only invisible, incomprehensible fear, crouching upon us from the night, that drives sensitive natures to the verge of madness and transforms stern warriors into cowards. Ernest realized the necessity of postponing the proposed investigation of Reginald's papers until the morning, as it was now near eleven, and he expected to hear at any moment the sound of his feet at the door. Before retiring he took a number of precautions. Carefully he locked the door to his bedroom and placed a chair in front of it. To make doubly sure, he fastened the handle to an exquisite Chinese vase, a gift of Reginald's, that at the least attempt to force an entrance from without would come down with a crash. Then, although sleep seemed out of the question, he went to bed. He had hardly touched the pillow when a leaden weight seemed to fall upon his eyes. The day's commotion had been too much for his delicate frame. By force of habit he pulled the cover over his ear and fell asleep. All night he slept heavily, and the morning was far advanced when a knock at the door, that at first seemed to come across an immeasurable distance, brought him back to himself. It was Reginald's manservant announcing that breakfast was waiting. Ernest got up and rubbed his eyes. The barricade at the door at once brought back to his mind with startling clearness the events of the previous evening. Everything was as he had left it. Evidently no one had attempted to enter the room while he slept. He could not help smiling at the arrangement which reminded him of his childhood, when he had sought by similar means security from burglars and bogies. And in the broad daylight Ethel's tales of vampires seemed once more impossible and absurd. Still, he had abundant evidence of Reginald's strange influence, and was determined to know the truth before nightfall. Her words, that thought is more real than blood, kept ringing in his ears. If such was the case, he would find evidence of Reginald's intellectual burglaries, and possibly be able to regain a part of his lost self that had been snatched from him by the relentless dream hand. But under no circumstances could he face Reginald in his present state of mind. He was convinced that if, in the fleeting vision of a moment, the other man's true nature should reveal itself to him, he would be so terribly afraid as to shriek like a maniac. So he dressed particularly slowly, in the hope of avoiding an encounter with his host. But fate thwarted his hope. Reginald, too, lingered that morning unusually long over his coffee. He was just taking his last sip when Ernest entered the room. His behaviour was of an almost bourgeois kindness. Benevolence fairly beamed from his face. But to the boy's eyes it had assumed a new and sinister expression. "'You are late this morning, Ernest,' he remarked in his mildest manner. "'Have you been about town, or writing poetry? Both occupations are equally unhealthy.' As he said this he watched the young man with an inscrutable smile that at moments was wont to curl upon his lips. Ernest had once likened it to the smile of Mona Lisa but now he detected in it the suavity of the hypocrite and the leer of the criminal. He could not endure it, he could not look upon that face any longer. His feet almost gave way under him, cold sweat gathered on his brow, and he sank on a chair trembling and studiously avoiding the other man's gaze. At last Reginald rose to go. It seemed impossible to accuse this splendid impersonation of vigorous manhood, of cunning and underhand methods, of plagiarisms and theft. As he stood there he resembled more than anything a beautiful tiger-cat, a wonderful thing of strength and will-power, indomitable and insatiate. Yet who could tell whether this strength was not, after all, parasitic? If Ethel's suspicions were justified, then, indeed, more had been taken from him than he could ever realize. 
for in that case it was his life-blood that circled in those veins, and the fire of his intellect that set those lips aflame. End of section 13